Lights are in. Cool. All right, so we are be we've begun and we're recording, and I'll usually give it like a, a thirty seconds or so for people to filter in. Sure. And are they all New York based, or or do you have remote students as well? Well, that's well, that's actually a really good question. Uh, this class is a remote class, the one that's meeting with us officially, uh, but I would wager that they're New York based and mostly Bronx based. Um, but this is open to the public and there might be members of the public from different countries. There has been before, you know, uh, and we've also had guests on that were in different countries. And uh, mm -hmm. I think last semester I spoke to someone in Portugal um, uh, and uh, there's been other areas of the world that I've spoken to people in. So it's, that's the great thing about these, you know, this technology is we can kind of meet with people all over the world and people yeah. can pipe in from anywhere. Uh, I'll, I'll get started. Um, so, uh, welcome everybody. So we're just chatting. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, this to the spring 2023 Sarah Little Turnbull visiting designer lecture series where we talk to various luminaries in the world of design, art, uh, the sciences, the activism. Uh, this semester, we're specifically focusing on design through a queer lens, uh, queer representation in the design industry. Uh, and how the products of that design industry include queer and non-binary users and audiences, or I guess exclude them as well as another thing we could talk about uh, mm -hmm. since they go, they're complementary. Um, this series is running concurrently with the Lehman College Art Gallery's current exhibition called Queer Love, Affection and Romance in Contemporary Art, which presents paintings and photographs that illuminate both individual and universal stories of vulnerability tenderness and desire in the LGBTQIA plus community. Uh, it opened on uh, Valentine's Day and it closes on April 28th. I actually get to walk by it on my, I'm very lucky. My office is like right across the hall from it. Uh, so I get to see it all the time. Uh, but if you don't, if you're not lucky like I am, go see it, make a trip. Uh, this uh, lecture series I should also mention is a direct component of an interdisciplinary course that focuses on LGBTQIA plus issues in design specifically. So, um, and the students are here today and hopefully they'll be interacting with us in the Q&A. And a full disclosure, my son is home from school today, not feeling well. So he might be interacting with us as well. Okay. Just like if it, yeah, just if it happens, not to freak anybody out. I'll say, also this is open to the public as I was just uh, telling our guests here. So everyone's will uh, encouraged to ask questions and join the conversation. We really love that. And finally, our guest, let me introduce our guest. Hillary London is the Director of Creative Editorial at ESPN, and she leads a team of visual storytellers that create content for eight linear networks, as well as ESPN Digital, social, and e platforms. She's a 12-year veteran of the company, and Hillary serves as the advisor to ESPN Equal, the company's LGBTQI plus uh, BERG, which stands for Business Employee Research Group. Um, when she's not working with her ESPN team, she serves as the executive, executive director of the Connecticut Chiropractic Council, protecting the practice of chiropractic, chiropractic care, excuse me, in the state of Connecticut. And I actually have a thing. So, you know, maybe we could talk about that offline. After we can I, fix that. Yeah. Yeah. You, we don't have to do it now. You need your neck adjusted. I can tell you yeah. right now. <laughs> Thank you so much for visiting with us today, Hillary. Uh, yeah. It's really, we're, we're honored to have you. I understand you have some things to show us, some of the work that uh, ESPN has been doing. Yeah, I want to, um, first, I, I'm looking at my background. I want to make sure you all know it doesn't just say mm. hell, all right? It <laughs> actually says, like, hello. Ah, okay. All right. Um, so I've slowly but surely been getting back onto campus and, and getting to decorate my <laughs> office. And I'm a big art fan. So just, of course, just of beyond course. the hello, I've got this awesome. Oh, yeah, there we go. Uh, that's wood carvers to do some cool stuff yeah that's a um angle. so for those tuning in it doesn't just say hell it's actually a greeting hello awesome. awesome um so what i want to take you all through today and by also please feel free to jump in at any point with questions um uh, whenever i present um i prefer they not stay till the end so when anyone wants yeah. to ch chime in on the chat or just unmute yourself you feel free um but wanted to lay the foundation by taking you through some of the work that the the business employee resource group does, um, which I was the co-chair for many, many years and now get to kind of sit back and advise them. 
um, mainly because this employee resource group, more than so many others on campus, and we have 10, um, actually does touch and inform our content more than others because it's the LGBTQIA plus space. Mm -hmm. um, and because honestly, that space itself intersects with just about every other demographic that you can think of. Um, and so we partner a lot with other business employee resource groups, but I want to dive into that. So I'll yeah. share my screen for a moment here, um, and then we'll probably pop it off and we'll get going into Q&A or just sure. our discussion. All right. Sure. Yeah. Um, so without further ado, I hope you can see that on your end. Yes. Yeah? Awesome. That's very colorful. All right. So uh ESPN Equal is our name. We used to be ESPN Prime when we first started. I honestly can't tell you what Prime stood for. And so that was why we switched to ESPN Equal. Everybody would ask us what that acronym was and we had no clue. Um, but we're pretty active. Uh, the center photo is a photograph from one of our Understanding the T panels. Um, so we did a lot of work on our trans uh, employee group. We're also really mm -hmm. fortunate to have uh, my co-advisor, who was the first employee to ever transition on the job throughout Disney. Um, oh, wow. ESPN is owned by Disney. And right. so when you think about that employee group, which is anywhere, you know, depending upon where we are, 190 to 200,000 employees. And she was the first. Wow. Wow. Um, and and then you think about ESPN, which over my just over a decade experience has certainly evolved in terms of the climate yeah. uh, for the good, for the good. Uh, yeah. And then all the way to the right, you'll see it's my favorite building, the Flatiron Building in New York. Um, that was from the first Pride Parade that we as a company showed up at uh, um, for Disney. Uh, took probably three years of my um employment to get us to be able to march in that parade. Um, wow. And then on the left are our friends in Brazil. Um, we work closely with them. Brazil, I think many of you know, is really an unsafe um, place yeah, yeah. For, for our community. And so we partner with them. I think they tell some incredibly daring stories, truly, um, especially considering the potential for um, really uh, endangering themselves. You know, even as a producer or a graphic designer, it's 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 not safe. Mm -hmm. um, so to the left, we've got you know part of our um, leadership team. In the middle was probably our single largest push, uh, which seems easy to do a T-shirt. Uh, we did this again around our Pride Parade March, but it took such a lift to get the company to support just that, to take our logo and Sports Center, which is our flagship show and put it in a rainbow coloration. And what I want you to notice there, uh, below that, this is Sports Center, which is in rainbow. The ESPN logo is not. Mm -hmm. We are extremely protective of our logo as a company. And still to this date, I have not been able to get any CEO to agree to let us uh, rainbow it for Pride Month. Um, a similar example that I've used is Bank of America does it in June, which if Bank of America can do it, I would think that we could do it, mm -hmm. uh, but not yet. And then uh, to the right, again, we took our sports center, one of our sports center shuttles and had them uh, kind of go with us through the parade, which is awesome because we got to keep water and stuff on those vans. Very handy. If you ever march in the parade, you cannot hydrate enough. It's brutal. Mm -hmm. um, we focus on membership engagement. Um, we provide mentoring opportunities for our members, not just within our business employee resource group, group but throughout the company, um, because I think it stands to reason that even to this day, a lot of individuals that um, are out at home may not be out at work. Um, and what I'm seeing more and more is that our employees that are gender neutral or gender binary nonconforming, um, mm -hmm. they're not they're not necessarily comfortable reaching out. And so we like to provide those connections. Um, we're trying to add some sort of retail around kind of an LGBTQ line for ESPN, but really content, content is what we do the most. Um, yeah. So taking you through the first, really the first kind of openly um, stories, the openly gay stories that we told um, back in the day, April, 2015, um, why we were trying to pull the final four out of Indiana, right? Um, April 15, if you haven't seen Renee, 
Um, I believe it's on uh, ESPN Plus. Uh, you might be able to Google it and find it somewhere on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But a fantastic story about probably the first uh, trans tennis player uh, known. I think there's probably some discussion way, way back in the day about Babe Diedrichson and, mm -hmm. and her being a member of the community. Um, but Renee is, is excellent. Okay. Um, outside the lines, the Caitlyn Jenner impact, you know, uh, that, uh, that was huge for us for so long and also such a polarizing figure. Um, in and outside of the community. I think many of you on this probably have a particular feeling about Caitlyn Jenner. We can discuss that once I get out of the deck. I know I do. Um, <laughs> I'll be sure uh, to Michael, ask you. Yeah, Michael Sam um, was the first player um, that uh, was going into the draft as an openly gay player. Um, wonderful individual, great speaker. We actually just did a follow-up uh, story about him probably a few months ago um, and while he was drafted he never really realized being able to play at that level and um, really lost himself you know certainly suffered from depression and then I think found an outlet for you know his abilities through Canadian football which there's a Canadian football league don't get me started on that who knew oh uh, there's there's all kinds of stuff are they any good I mean <laughs> um I think there's a reason why you're not watching it every weekend, right? <laughs> um, uh, similar to that month and probably one of our most successful educational pushes was the Courage Game. Um, mm -hmm. And again, if you haven't watched that, I would encourage you to do so. Such a young, young individual uh, who was able to articulate his need for coming out at that age. Um, avid lacrosse player. Um, located on Long Island. I used to be a lacrosse coach collegiately, so that, you know, really yeah. resonated with me. Uh, yeah. But we were able to maintain a lot of contact with him and his family, and we did two different campus uh, educational sessions for um, all of our employees, really well attended, and such a bright, bright young man. Um, yeah. We had our ESPN, the magazine, back when it was in print, um, out issue, which huge push and lift to get the company to agree to that. And this is, it seems like so long ago, it's 2015, but it took us all that time to get there um, and to find athletes that trusted us enough to put that in print. Um, Izzy Gutierrez coming out, um, you know, Mason Darrow, uh, transgender athletes, um, this was our kind of roller derby push. I think we have um, some more uh, current storylines that touch on that now. But again, this was what we were looking for in 2015 was how do we even get this story, um, you know, out there and how do we get production to support it? And that's that's no small push. Um, Greg Luganis, right? Mm -hmm. I think some people on this call might be too young to perhaps remember how groundbreaking breaking that was a gay out Olympic diver. And then afterwards we find out that he's HIV positive. Yeah. Um, uh, transgender locker rooms. I see a typo in there. Apologize for that. That's okay. Steph That's okay. Stephanie Dolson, um, who's great. I mean, you want to talk to someone who is just loud and proud and um, mm -hmm. doesn't give a crap. I mean, she gives a great, a great interview um, and a really talented, you know, very well-known uh, collegiate basketball player and now plays pro as well. Um, and uh, Chris Mosier is someone who, if any of you aren't following him on LinkedIn, I would really encourage you to. Um, he is one of the first transgender Olympians, um, a member of the Olympic team um, for triathlons. Um, and I was really lucky to be able to meet Chris and kind of forge a relationship um, over time through different um, like out and equal events. Uh, but he's got some really neat nonprofits that he's a part of. Um, really, really cool guy. Does a lot with trying to get corporations to get a little bit more with it. Um, and then the most recent biggest one I would say is Life is Matt, um, which again, if you haven't watched that, I would encourage you to watch it. It's about um, a high schooler who ran cross country and track and was transitioning. Um, and we had an extremely heavy, heavy hand in the timeline of this story. Um, you know, some of the verbiage, uh, a lot of the verbiage that was used in telling this story, 
Um, and I believe at the end was where we felt it was really important to just put up a simple black and white slate um, of support services. Hmm. And that's something that the production team hadn't thought about until um, you know, we had mentioned it of for anyone who's struggling, you know, here's a helpline. Um, and then there was also a really brutal, this one isn't as uplifting at all, uh, but brutal story about hazing. Um, mm -hmm you know, collegiately that was out there. Yeah. Uh, so that's just a few things. I think Carl, um, sorry, Carl Nassib is more recent. Um, you know, you've got our uh, Penn State swimmer, certainly more recent. Um, but every time one of these stories is coming up, it's our team that is saying, hey, mm, don't say that, say this. And right. so an example where we stubbed our toe and then I'll, I'll stop and let you take a, I'll take a breath and you could ask away, David. Yeah, um, yeah. When we had, we knew, so we knew that we were going to have an NFL player coming out, right? We, we know that that's our luxury is because we treat the story fairly, people come to us and they give us a little bit of a preview so that we can do our best job. Sure. We didn't necessarily know which player was coming out, but we've been ready for this for years. Uh, and then I believe it was a radio for TV show that when Carl came out, the lower third, which is the part underneath the typed part underneath where it's it be their name or something. It said first actively gay NFL player. Mm. That's strange. Oops. Oops. Yeah. You're letting your, you're letting your, you know, grammar skirt show. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's like, I'm gay today, but I'm taking the day off tomorrow. Like yeah. It was, it was well, and it, um, it suggested, Jimmy Kimmel had a field day with it. Yeah, it kind of suggests that word active suggests that it is a choice. It's a behavior mm -hmm. uh, or just part of a, an affectation or a lifestyle. Yeah. And, it's, and they I, meant it about being active and in the NFL. Right. Right. That was the yeah. point was this is our first, this is our first NFL player you know, currently playing who is out. That's what they yeah. meant. But their structure, their sentence structure got the best of them. And it makes it look like it's a choice. And so even just those yeah. small little details of, and that's an editorial graphics producer that yeah. typed that up. Those small little details, you could have called any one of us 10 minutes before the show ran five minutes, I would have picked up to say, no, don't, don't say it that way first NFL player comes out as gay, boom. And then let the verbiage, the talk, the discussion explain that lower third. Don't yeah. overcomplicate the lower third. Which I think is good advice anyway. <laughs> as someone who makes lower thirds, it's like- oh, Well, yeah. just like graphics, right? Graphics, yeah. when you look at an image, it's probably that Audrey Hepburn rule of, oh no, no, Coco Chanel of- Coco take Chanel, one, right. Take one thing off before you leave the house. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I tell and my so students that, that as well. So Yeah. So for that graphic, what's one thing you could lose that's probably an unintended complicator? So, okay, that's that's kind of interesting. So in other words, you're already sort of in the in the driver's seat when it comes to the kind of graphics that are on air at ESPN. And by the way, I just want to let, I mean, I'm not into sports at all. And that's going to lead into some other questions I have. Mm -hmm. um, I've just never been into them, right? I just, it's just not for me. I mean, I love to run. I, I love to exercise. I love hiking and all that stuff, but I'm not into sports and sports mm -hmm. is a culture and it's larger than just the game. And I want to talk about that, but um, I guess maybe, you know, what I do know about ESPN is y'all have some of the most groundbreaking graphics of any broadcasting company in the world. I mean, you yeah. know that you were, it's, they're unbelievable, right? It's, if you want to look at, the cutting edge of what's happening on on-air graphics today. Mm -hmm. You turn on Sports Center or many of your other properties. You turn them on and you yep. watch them. So, yep. uh, it, you guys have really great designers. Let's just, let's just be frank. And you do most of your um, graphics in house. Is that would you say yeah. that's right? Yeah. And even even the graphics packages that we send out of house. Um, the challenge with that is how they're constructed in Adobe. Um, or yeah. in some cases, Cinema 4D. Right. Um, they're they're made beautifully, but but an out of house agency isn't constructing them to be manipulated quickly. Gotcha. And so whenever they come in, then my team or the graphics graphics team uh, will have to essentially 
take those elements and make them far more user friendly. Yeah. With yeah. Um, sensical drop downs or with expressions that can be broken into more easily. Um, so right. all those things come into play. So where you might get, they think they're giving us a full Thanksgiving dinner and right. we're going, uh, okay, now we got to make the Parker house rolls. Now we got to make the mac and cheese. Now we got to, you know, now yeah. we gotta round it out. Um, and so gotcha. I think the new MBA package, I'll see if I can pull up. Um, yeah, sure. I'll, let me just do a search. Cause that was a little bit uh, ago, but the new MBA package, which is really, it's gorgeous. It's sleek. Um, or if I can play this one, I'm going to try and play it out, but I'm going to play out the gymnastics um, okay. package. This is um, kind of cool. We're getting like inside access behind the, this is the new. hood. Here. Yeah, this, this is isn't cool. um, this isn't really out there yet. It might That's be a little exciting. jittery. All right. Yeah. And I apologize for that. But I think if you focus on just some of the actual images, um, yeah. it'd be pretty cool. And gymnastics is a sport where because it's not football or basketball or anything, it didn't get much love, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it's getting this new package. And can you see my mouse I moving could, there? I could see, yeah, I could see your mouse moving, yeah. Okay, cool, let's see how we do. This is yeah, the behind the scenes shoot. Oh, wow. It's very- and um they got two, um, oh, good, I'll shut up. Oh, it's beautiful. And this, so you're filming in front of a scram to get well, the outline. watching. So notice how uh, the I lines see. disappear. Yeah. Right. So the curtain had lines in it. They were able to wipe that out. Right. It's composited with type animations. Yeah. Beautiful. It's such an elegant way. Now, what is this? Is um. That's all the cinema 4D. That's all in cinema 4D. Yep. Oh wow, it's beautiful. So wow. all the different elements, each one needs yeah. its own thing, right? It's, it's the bumper, right? This is my favorite part, that curtain. Yeah. Look at the so wrinkling. It's a, it's a digital curtain. You're generated. Oh, it's Just, intense. This is so it's intense. Stunning. And so they dropped that camera motion in there, right? This is them playing with that color story a little bit. So Friday Night Flights. Yeah. Right, as opposed to Friday Night Lights. Right, right, right. right. You know what I love about it is it's so it celebrates the sport, like it celebrates mm -hmm. the 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 motion of the bodies, and it's it's feminine, but it's also powerful. Like it's yeah. really got it's got a cool vibe to it. So that oh. you just saw the curtain come up. So this yeah. is a competition between those two schools. So that's wow. So that's a little bit of. Um, that was completely internal yeah. Um, yeah um so there was nothing you know there was nothing that we were going to send out a house for that because it wasn't nba or nfl or what have you right um, but that was done by some of our editors that work a lot with marketing um and then i want to see if i can find a you can keep talking and asking questions so i want to make yeah, sure well, we touch on like the lgbtq nature of this yeah um, but I guess, I'll pull I up mean, an animation too. Yeah, pull that up. I, I guess my, uh, I have so many questions, but I think like one of them <laughs> is, it's a very basic question and I know the answer. It's a stupid question. It's like a naive question. But why sports, why do sports need designers? Like why does, you know, like I know this is sports journalism, it, it, it's media based, but um, aren't, aren't watching the games enough? I mean, there's like lots of activity on the screen. Like why do we need more? You'd think that, um, yeah. but I think the reason why you need designers is it's gotten, just getting anyone to sit down for any amount of time and watch is so competitive in nature. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so Dorothy asked, which outside firms do we use? We use so many. Um, yeah. There's not one singular one. And so when we are putting something kind of outside, we'll put it out um, to bid. And so different agencies will, um, you know, give us their pitch, basically. Yeah. And we go with the pitch that we like the best. 
Um, Arts and Letters, just off the top of my head, is one that I know we've used um, a bit for our marketing. But when okay. it comes to uh, an outside agency for a feature, um, that can vary. You know, we use um, we use some local uh, firms in Connecticut to us. Uh, but then it also depends on if it's a documentary and it's a director, producer, editor. Sometimes they'll do it themselves. Uh, right. Good question. Thank you. Um, so the competitive nature of just getting anyone to watch anything, we're all in that boat, regardless of whether it's sports or Yellowstone, um, which right. is my, if you, if you, you like all aren't watching Yellowstone or I'm not into, I haven't watched it, no. Buckle up, get going. I hear good things. I hear great things. But. Great things. Um, or, you know, I think um, White Lotus, right? Everyone mm -hmm. was all hyped on Jennifer Coolidge and White Lotus sure. because the production value was there. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. our eye has gotten used to seeing score bugs on the bottom, seeing ads pop up in the corner or chiclets, um, seeing uh, certainly for certain games, um, advertising wipes come in and come out. And I think there's certain networks that do it better than others. Right, yeah. um, I think sometimes it's very, very distracting. I think HDTV has gone a little wackadoo on how many things come at you and they literally block what you're trying to watch. Yeah. Uh, we, we are very, very intentional in the movement that we create in the screen. But also if you look at our broadcasting and our score bugs on the bottom, even just three years ago to what we have now, it's so much sleeker. Yeah. So we're trying to get back to simplifying it, keeping it really clean, making it easy to read. Um, yeah. Sometimes what we had in the past for like a possession arrow to indicate, you know, who would get the jump ball win, that wasn't clear. Yeah. It wasn't clear. And so for the avid sports fan, they're looking for that. For the casual sports fan, it needs to be even more digestible for someone that may not know the rules, right? Yep. Um, but we believe that all those graphics make it look better. Sure. Right? Or yeah. identify. So if you're watching one of those pieces that I spoke about, Life is Matt, as an example, um, that's not a public figure, you know? Um, yeah. And so you need that graphical lower third underneath to introduce them. Um, the next person that comes on the screen is a woman. You don't know if it is or isn't Matt's mother. And so yeah. we need that lower third to to help you understand why is this person important to the story? Yeah, I think story is a key word here mm -hmm. um, because it's funny, like last last Friday, I was talking to a game designer her named Colleen MacLean, and she's she makes all kinds of games. But um, she was I, I asked her, like, are you know, she was making mainly political games. Um, hmm. It, when she got started, like not necessarily political, but about political topics, like how to understand uh, the electoral college, right? Like digesting it into a game like setting where people can like think about it in a fun, engaging way, right? Because it's not an engaging topic off the, uh, you know, on paper, right? So, <laughs> but I asked her like, but I, you know, my, in my understanding of games, games are not supposed to be serious. They're, mm -hmm. they're like, they're, they are supposed to be in fact, uh, to, to sort of like distract you from from real life and the 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 problems that you have in real life and take your mind off of it. Yeah. So so my question is is you know and there are flaws with that. I don't actually believe that. I think games can be very serious. Obviously, sports, which are games, right? Football, mm -hmm. even gymnastics. These are games, right? There's mm -hmm. there's talent and skill involved. But ultimately, they're games. They're people playing a game on a field and getting paid millions of dollars. Millionaires running around playing games. Mm -hmm. um, but so I guess my question is, is like, if that's the case, then why is there this sort of like disconnect or maybe tension between LGBTQ issues and sports? Like, why wouldn't it? Why is there like, uh, why is it such a challenge to tell these stories and you know, if it's just yeah. a game and we're just having fun here, what is it about sports in general, organized sports in this country that is so inured to that? Sure. So I think, um, and we've got some other questions in the Q&A that yeah. I'll try and lace in here. Yeah, um, of course. Sure. So, it, uh, 
and I, I failed in giving like some more historical background. I used to be a collegiate coach uh, for 11 years. I coached field hockey and lacrosse and then just lacrosse uh, before coming to ESPN. And um, I taught women, the history of women in sport and culture. Uh, and so I think in answer to your question, why sports matter so much and it is taken to such a high level is if you look at any newspaper in the early 1900s, which in order to create a newspaper in the early 1900s, you would have to hand place the typeface, right? Yep. And back then newspapers were like 15 to 20 pages. Right. Eight of those pages were about sports. Eight of wow. them. Is that so, really true? Wow. Yeah. And it's wow. because back then, again, you didn't have TV. You didn't, you, you just had radio, but might not be in every household. Right. right? right. And so that was the thing to do. Yeah. Like literally, like what else were you going to do? You were going to work either in a factory or on a farm. Um, yeah. You know, and and then as a pastime, right, predominantly baseball, but also boxing was huge then. Sure. You would go and that was your, you know, kick your feet up and relax and watch yeah. these athletes perform. And so because that importance was so highly valued back then, that's just never gone away. Yeah. And most people would look at a sporting event, I think the way that you or I do, which is it's entertaining and it's fun. Um, we at ESPN are the entertainment sports network right yeah. that's our goal right. you're open um, about that yeah and um and so we do look at it as fun but when you think about it as the athlete um where they're working professionally to get there to make that million dollar multi-million dollar deal that's not a low pressure thing yeah um when you think about the gambling tied to sports you know that's it's a whole separate entity where it's a different make, subculture oh yeah. yeah that's that's crazy and yeah and for the level that they're gambling at all they need to do is make a winning bet 51 percent of the time right because they're gambling in such massive and frequent amounts um and then you get people that it is very much their identity. You know, they just, I, that fandom, they identify so intensely. That's key. With that home team, or it's because that's what, and a lot of times, mostly men, um, that's what they did with their fathers. Yeah. Right. Their team is their father's team. And so it's just this very ingrained sense of their identity yeah. that it is so highly valued. I think that that's key. And that's why, Again, like I was never into sports. I never looked up to any uh, sports figures of any kind uh, growing but up. But I bet you um, have a favorite artist or a favorite author. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I have right? like favorite politicians, also like politicians yeah. and like philosophers and stuff like that. I'm very nerdy in that way, right? Favorite designers, <laughs> of course, right? Um, but it's interesting because I see sports figures mm -hmm. as as their heroes to young children. Could be. Right? Uh, yeah. They they and they identify with them as heroes, and it's another thing we were actually talking about uh, last week, which is about the hero's journey, and how uh, how like it the hero's journey doesn't necessarily as written right like doesn't necessarily mesh with queer culture, right? No. The you know there's a disconnect there, and I think that's a problem because. LGBTQ people can and are heroes, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, like like the people at ACT UP and like Harvey Milk and and you know these are heroes. Like they're heroes to me because yeah. they fought for social justice and they they gave their lives in some cases, in many cases. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not I'm a cisgender man. Like you know, I don't mm -hmm. you know I'm not um, I I'm an ally, but I I can identify with that. Um, so I think like that's key. And I was wondering if you could talk about that. It's, I guess it's like, I don't wanna, I wanna talk about the culture war without talking about the culture war, if that makes sense. Because mm -hmm. it's like, you know, it, uh, is, it, is it that people who are into sports and who identify in that world feel as if perhaps their identity is gonna be threatened by LGBTQ players because Again, then if, if there are queer or non-binary people playing sports, 
they're occupying those identities as well. And is that perhaps an encroachment? I'm like, I'm just trying to like understand yeah. where the- So there's a, there's a couple different things in that question. I think, yeah. and I wanna parse them out because I think that we are absolutely, not really on the cusp, I think we're kind of in it, but there is um, an intense scrutiny and sensitivity to trans athletes, Yeah. right? Yeah. And some might say the reasoning behind that is the belief that a trans athlete is taking away from the opportunity of mm -hmm. um, a cis born athlete. Yeah. Um, but inherently as humans, we all feel uneasy about something that we don't understand. Yeah. And how we demonstrate that uneasiness will vary individual to individual. Um, sport, which does have physical contact and in many sports I don't want to say all because golf is not a particularly violent sport um, but you would have thought the same thing about figure skating and look at mm -hmm. Nancy Harrigan um, yeah. <laughs> you know it's yeah. a lot of our sports are full contact sports or even partial right. contact sports you know they consider football full they sure. don't consider basketball full but I guarantee you you play up against you know, a, an upper level basketball player, you're coming away with bruises because of their defense. Oh, yeah. Position, right. Yeah. 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 Um, and so I never viewed those as different. Um, for anyone that's played a contact sport, it's you, there's this adrenaline rush and adrenaline push um, that I personally, I think, have only gotten also from CrossFit. I haven't gotten it anywhere else. You know, when, mm -hmm. I, when I give a great presentation, I'm like, oh, that was fun, but it's not the same as. No. It's not as visceral. No. And so there is that that physical reaction um, and gratification that you get in the win and the disappointment in the loss mm -hmm. um, and also in accordance with your own performance. And so when it comes to the LGBTQIA plus athlete, I think people's support or lack thereof is due to how they respond to anything that's challenging. And I work with a ton of people that... Um, that are very change adverse. Yeah. Right? And the only thing I can promise you at ESPN is we will always change. There will always be change. We evolve as a company very quickly. Yeah. Um, and so if you're not comfortable with change, don't work here. Right? I tell right. people that up front. Um, and then I think it also comes down to how they're raised, you know, and how confident they are in their own uh, skin. Yeah. Right. It's it's interesting because it now occurs to me that sports journalism, and I think you and I have talked about this before, is really just storytelling. Mm -hmm. It happens to be a very specific niche kind of storytelling with real people doing real things, mm -hmm. playing sports, right? And also living their lives. There's this there's this story of what happens on the field, but then there's also the story beyond that story, right? So there's like there's Brittany Griner, for example, the the basketball player. Yep. And then there's Brittany Griner, the, you know, the formerly, uh, the former captive in Russia. Um, and there's Brittany Griner, who is uh, queer and married to a, a woman. And, mm -hmm. and um, that's a whole bigger story that that's the one we were focusing on for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And now, and I know just, just, I just heard that she's now joined up with a, a women's league basketball team recently. Um, again, I don't follow sports, but mm -hmm. the story is sort of like back to the sports, I think. Yeah, Hopefully. the Phoenix. Yeah, yeah I believe yeah. she was the Phoenix. Um, uh, that, that, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, and I think part of that, I'm very intrigued and I've, I've asked one of our content people to ask um, to our leadership, when and if we get a sit down interview with her. Um, yeah. Because I don't know, you know, it's so above our level. Is she even allowed to say anything about Russia? Right. That's a good, good, like, very good point. The political implications. I mean, it's a. This isn't a non-crazy time. No. So you know, we may not get that for years and years and years, if ever. Yeah. Um, you know, we can certainly sit down and talk with her about coming back to basketball and how is that going, and you know, so thrilled to have you, um, but you know, her imprisonment might be a topic that we just never get to interview her on. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as much as we follow the story and want the story, it's never our goal uh, to piss off the White House. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
or so, the intelligence community or you know yeah so Brittany has just always been such a polarizing figure and I'm sure you all saw it if you followed you know her imprisonment in Russia at all is whenever that showed up in your your Facebook feed or as a news alert uh you know the comments associated with that um were too it was either or it was bring bring Brittany home right or she got what she deserved mm-hmm. you know what was she thinking there was no middle yeah, you know, there's, there's no one talking about her, it. no one talking about her three point average oh, or stance or yeah. Oh no, it was she she knew full well and made a dumb decision or you know bring her back. This is way over the top. They're using her as a political tool um, yeah. as an example. Um, and you know, whereas if you look at like a a Caitlyn Jenner, yeah, um, who. I mean, I want to know who did the plastics work on her because I want their name. And that's a, I want yeah. that work done personally. <laughs> well, it's, I, I think it's also Kim Kardashian's person. It's like a very famous Beverly Hills. All right, Hills. well, I don't, I don't know I, if I, I would know that. Of it. Yeah. yeah, it's probably very, uh, very expensive. Yeah, uh, and so when you guess. look, yeah, when you look at the outcome of her transitioning, that is, you know, arguably one of the best physical outcomes. Yeah. Right. Um, because of the socioeconomic status that afforded her that opportunity. Um, right. I think the thing that floors me about Caitlyn Jenner is Caitlyn's special afterwards, where I think her intent was good, which is to try and use her platform to and her ignorance to say, let's all be ignorant and learn together. Right. Right. But what floored me, and I think floored many, is you just went through this life-altering physical transformation, and you're saying, "Ooh, I had no idea that that was that it was challenging for the trans community." Right. I mean, that is just—it's absurd, right? It's, it's tone absurd. deaf. It's tone oh, deaf. Oh, so, yeah. um, and so that you know, I don't think that that ever um, ever helped either the community or herself. So I let's bring it back to design because mm-hmm. um, I, I there's this um, in my mind there's nothing intrinsic about type or layout or even color that has mm-hmm. anything any sort of intrinsic connection to someone's sex or gender identity. Mm-hmm. Um, although of course colors are very culturally based and mm-hmm. we have a whole you know with pride obviously there's the rainbow. Yeah. of colors so it's every color right on purpose that's by design but also even in the lgbtqia plus community there are separate color palettes for each one of those letters right and yes. you know for trans for um a for asexual or or transitioning and and they all have different i don't know tribes i guess and they all have a flag yeah. associated with it but those are largely arbitrary they're like there is no and they're important, but there are there is no intrinsic design in my mind mm-hmm. that can that can help um, or hinder the 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 LGBTQ community moving forward. But I think, you work... I think there's design that can hinder. Okay. Yeah. I okay. Do. So tell me about that. Yeah. Um. So I was just you know I'm googling as you talk, and and it was mm-hmm. actually something that I mentioned yesterday uh, with my uh, equal board was for the. For Pride Month, I want us to offer a uh, history of the Pride flag, the evolution yeah. of the Pride flag. All right, just a quick minute thirty kind of quick video of here's how we sure. evolved. Um, but I think it depends on what you're trying to get across and what your audience is. Um, and so, uh, if you are holding a, a drag bingo event in Provincetown. Mm-hmm. I'd say that's the, it's a super safe audience. And so whatever you yeah. want, right. However yeah. you want to advertise it, however go you huge. want to yeah. go, yeah. go. If you are advertising that same event, uh, but in a different location, like let's just say Salt Lake city, Utah. Sure. There you go. Would that poster look the same? Okay. Maybe. Yeah. Because you could say, I only want to attract the people that are cool with this poster. Or, no, I really I really want to use this as an opportunity to, to bring new people and new ideas and thought in. And so I've got to meet them a little bit more of where they are. Yeah. And, and so that's where I think design absolutely um, 
can help or hinder, right? Okay, yeah. I mean, you were, you were, it's interesting, you were showing the, the early in the presentation that you gave the, the sports center shirt with the, you know, it said sports center was in the rainbow colors, mm -hmm. but then the ESPN logo was not. Yep. It was in its traditional red color, which I'm, I'm, I know has a Pantone yes. code associated with it. And it's one. like, you yeah. can't, you, yeah, the one you're wearing, and you may not deviate with, from it. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess maybe, could you maybe talk about that and why? Because I know this is not this that that by the way is not specific to ESPN. Every company that has a logo has very strict guidelines about where yep. the logo appears, what color it's in, what 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 kind of background it's on. Even like the geometry of the logo it can't. Be oh, the angles. Spot. There's a whole the I angles, took a whole yeah. class about the angle of our logo. It's fascinating. Um, is it is a That's full a, forty-five minutes? Uh, but it's really cool. Uh, so I think why is it so important though? Like because it's ours, right? Yeah. It's it's no one else can use that. I can't remember the degrees. It's like a it's like a 33 and a half degree angle or something. Um so it's just so indicative of of what we are and what we do that um it it is us. You know, just like yeah. the Michigan M, right? Or or the Disney Castle. Um right. I have them over in my credenza there. So we we go to out and equal every year. We have a pretty good sized contingent that goes there. Um, pins are very big at this conference. You'll trade mm -hmm. pins with people. So we mm -hmm. have an ESPN equal pin that is rainbowed with our logo because that is our logo. Sure. Um, but we were never able to do ESPN in rainbow fashion. Yeah. And the company's reasoning behind that was again, to protect the logo. Because if we did it as a business employee resource group, then Pulse, uh, which is our Black Afro-American affinity group, would probably want to do something for them. Sure. Um, so yeah. would Trust, which is our mental health uh, resource group, you know, ESPN Woman, and so on and so forth. And so you'd mm -hmm. end up with this logo that could become 11 different things when yeah. it really is supposed to be just one. Yeah. It's... Um, it it's a just I mean it's a branding thing right like you don't mm -hmm. want to splinter the brand and I'm wondering if something similar could or even should happen with the LGBTQIA plus community like is there not that I'm not suggesting that the community which is not a thing you could just grab together and push in mm -hmm. a direction I'm not suggesting that they um, go to a branding expert and come up with like a national uh, a national body goes to a branding yeah. expert or consultant that gets the brand because that's very committee thinking and that's really not how the on the ground community works um, or should but I'm just wondering like from a design perspective is there a way that um, beyond the, the pride flag and the various mm -hmm. under flags that exist the sub flags is there another set of ways that branding could perhaps help the LGBTQ community build something that's consistent and strong and 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 really evokes a sort of empowerment as opposed to you know uh, you know having to be subversive which you know in the 50s well there's a whole scene that i'm like researching of design and image and text that goes back to like you know the early 20th century and it was very early on it was very subversive mm -hmm. right you know um even into the fifties, it was a very subvert, there were very subversive messaging and symbolism. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, and it's, it's subversion kind of means hiding, right? It's like, it kind of means you're trying to, you're trying to subvert a, a larger consensus system and get underneath it and message to people who are in the know. But is there a way you think to do something in the 21st century that's open and proud and, um, and empowering? Yeah, I think it's so it's it's interesting because I one of the one of the things that I personally struggle with is uh, it used to be the LGBT community. Yeah, then yeah. it was LGBTQ community. Then it was LGBTQ plus community. Mm -hmm. Then and now it is LGBTQIA plus, right. which which I it's know because. Yeah, because I had yeah. I reiterate it, you know, so frequently. Um, yeah. But I do think we're getting to a point that where the intent is each letter represents a really important part of our human community. 
because it's getting so long, it's getting mm-hmm. more and more what people would refer to as alphabet soup. Yep. And so where the intent is, hey, this letter represents me, the the rest of the public is going, I can't even keep track. It's too much. So yeah. we're losing, we're losing that willingness to learn and to understand because it is getting to be a true mouthful and um, you know, just really long acronym, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that the human rights campaign kind of answers what you say i think that glad certainly answers kind of that idea um and so i think the flag and i'm looking at it on my other monitor right now yeah um, yeah i should probably share that instead of staring off into the distance um (laughs) but when we look at you know this is kind of where it started right just a simple linear rainbow this is where it's gone to and now, you know, this is where we are, right? Yep. Of when you look at that flag, how much more can we honestly fit in there visually? Yeah. It's not a lot. I mean, it's running right. out of room. And also it's doing that thing we were just talking about with the ESPN logo where it's splintering the brand. Yeah. It's and becoming- so that point, if we yeah. keep adding layers behind that, um, I don't know, it's not a chevron, but if we keep if we keep adding stripes behind, eventually it will come across. And so you'll no longer be able to really see the green and the yellow, really. They'll probably be just be little slivers left of the flag if the point needs to continue across to accommodate for additional layers of representation behind that. Yeah. Um, and I don't know who the the guru is that goes, here's the new flag. Yeah, you know, I honestly don't know, um, because I think there's so many permutations out there. You can kind of buy what you want. Right. Um, yeah. But it is interesting to think of how this continues to change over time to be more inclusive. Yeah. But at the same time, from from and this is just me, from my perspective, perhaps um, not as identifiable. Yeah. That that makes sense. Um yeah, I mean, I think again, I'm not the I'm not the guru. I'm not the person, um, but I am a designer, and I'm constantly thinking about solving problems. Right. Mm. So if there is, you know, if there is a a problem with the branding, it's not even branding. I'm using the term branding, but it's you know, it's kind of like not that's not what it's meant to be. But if if there's an issue with it where it's not doing its job, like you're saying, and perhaps it's leaving other people out of it. Um, I think it is an important thing for young designers, mm. specifically designers who who identify as queer and non-binary, to think about like how are we going to do this in the future as yeah. designers and take well, there's up your, that. There's your class project of yeah. You know, see yeah. who can come up with a new LGBTQIA plus flag. Yeah. That sorry, my light keeps shining. It's okay. Off it. Um, that maybe accommodates for continued growth yeah. but is more visually pleasing than what we have going on here like a system something mm-hmm. systematic i like that idea i i want to we have like a seven minutes left yeah. i guess and i just i wanted to talk about um the culture war again without talking about it uh mm-hmm. so Flor- florida uh as you may know just removed uh disney your parent company is um the reedy creek development association mm-hmm. like they're they're sort of like governing body that almost acted as its own sort of system of governance governance in in that area in Orlando mm-hmm. where Disney World is and it was because of like political retribution right it had yes. nothing to do with you know whatever the governor is saying it was um it's all about uh Disney's stance on the don't say gay bill and mm-hmm. and I also think Disney's um val- you know uh laudable attempts to increase representation in its media, um, and 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 its workforce, and 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 in ver- in various different strata of what Disney does. I mean, Disney is one of the, if not the biggest media company in the United States. It's definitely like in the top five. Oh yeah, we're I mean, we're yeah. There's there's like Viacom, and you know there's uh, like the CBS owned by Viacom, or I, I don't I don't know the well, name. You've the, got Turner. You've got Turner. Um, that's right. Yeah. Yes, you've got a few, but yeah, we're yeah. top five for sure. 
and AT and T is in there as well somewhere. They're, they're technically a. But anyway, my I guess where my question is is that I believe that media companies like ESPN have have a, a sacred duty, mm -hmm. just as all designers and artists do, to stand up for what they believe in and to do what's right. So I applaud Disney for what they they've done. But I am at the same time like really disenchanted with how uh, state and local and possibly federal government can respond to these things in such mm -hmm. a way to for political retribution. And I'm just wondering, like, as a I don't know how much you can comment on this, but as a, a, a technically a Disney employee, right? By mm -hmm. by, like, how do you feel? What are your chances? I mean, Connecticut is a very very liberal state. You guys have a great governor. Um, yeah. Awesome, dude. Um, he, I, a lot of props to that guy. But, you know, in other words, Connecticut's like part of the coastal liberal elite states, I guess you could say. You, you could argue mm -hmm. that. So, um, but what, how are you feeling about ESPN's chances about, quote unquote, going woke and then surviving the, the culture war? Um, I don't really, I don't have any concerns about ESPN or really Disney as a whole. Um, yeah. Because I think that we are... Um, we know who we are, we know what we stand for, we know what our values yeah. are. And, yeah. and I wouldn't, I think that's what's kept me here this long uh, because yeah. Yeah. you know, increasingly as anyone gets older um, and you, you may or may not have the opportunity to stay in one place for a, a particular amount of time, um, if you work somewhere where the community and the values match yours, that just becomes more and more important to you. And, yeah. and so yeah. I don't, I don't worry about that at all. You know, I know that our leadership shares the same value structure that I do. I feel very confident in saying that. Um, I think that how, you know, different state legislative bodies respond to that is beyond our control. Yeah. And I say this to my, my folks all the time is you can only control what you can control. And, and some of these things are outside of our purview, but it doesn't change what our values are, what our approach is. And so we control completely how we interact with our employees and our teammates and our partners. And we mm -hmm. wanna make sure it's a great experience, right? Um, yeah. I think the challenge that any company has, big or small, and we are huge, is um, the media and how it gets skewed or what people put on TikTok and then it goes viral mm -hmm. and it gets run mm -hmm. with. Um, and so I charge your students and really the public in, in general to always consider the source. Yeah. Right. And evaluate that appropriately. So if you see that TikTok from that employee that goes, I can't believe I have to come back to work four days a week, da, 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 um, I would say consider the source. You know, they have things that are important to them. There is a job that needs to be done. Um, and maybe at this point where they are in our life, I think this is a great pertinent example. Um, yeah. You know, the need to be in person doesn't match their uh, desires for their employment. Right. And yeah. for other people, they're going, oh, God, I great. I hated being home alone. I need people. I need to be around them. I'm excited to come back. Yeah. Um, but the the skew of the story is around, you know, the noise of, um, you know, coming back to work. And that's a travesty. Yeah. And so as Disney, we're wearing that hat because we're such a large employer. But I guarantee you, every single employer is battling that challenge. Yeah. At this point yeah. in time. Um, yeah. So in answer to that's a roundabout way to say I'm not I'm not concerned about, you know, Florida stance um, on the LGBTQIA plus community, because I know that is not going to infringe upon or change our value structure as a company. No way. Yeah. That's no great way to hear. That's really great to hear. Uh, one the quick last question. How important this is from Dorothy uh, yeah. in the Q&A. How important is I've always wondered this. So. How important is it to understand and play sports for working at ESPN, especially it, in, in your world, like in the design and- did, Yeah, you know, it depends on the world. job that you're applying for. So yeah. I think a lot of my team, um, so if you are a, a quick turn editor working in our newsroom, I think sports is really important because you're sure. working so quickly to generate that highlight or react to that breaking news. Yeah. I think if you're one of our custom animators, doesn't matter. You, you need to know design. You need to know after yeah. effects, like the back of your hand. You need yeah. to know color theory. You need to know how to animate, right? Yeah. And so that's the most important thing. If you work in HR here, you don't need to know sports, right? Yeah. So I think that's the the really cool thing that as people 
learn more, they think, oh my gosh, I didn't know that that job existed at ESPN. So there's a ton of jobs where sports doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of our production jobs, it's absolutely important because of the pace that we work at. Interesting. You know? Yeah. Well, this, listen, this has been fascinating. We'll get to my, my back problems in another. All right. We'll talk about so, that another time. That's, I'm not going to bore everyone with that. Thank you so <laughs> much for, for meeting with us today. This has been fascinating. I have yeah. a lot more to, to ask you and I, I will, I'm sure by yeah, email. Feel at some free. Point. Um, uh, again, Hillary Nelson, thank you for meeting with us. I'm going to end it there, everybody. Everybody, I'll see you all next Friday at the same time. Uh, Hillary, have a good day. Thank you so much. Thanks, you too. Have a good weekend when you all get there. Yes, yes. Take care. All right, bye now, everyone.